Good afternoon and welcome to the first ever DRC State of the Workforce. My name is Drexel Owusu and I'm the Senior Vice President of Education and Workforce at the Dallas Regional Chamber. The mission of the DRC is to make Dallas region the best place to live, work, and do business for all people. And an important element of that is to develop a strong workforce uh, at all levels from pre-K through adult education. The DRC's education and workforce team works closely with regional education, government, and businesses to create a skilled workforce that meets the needs of the business community today and for years to come. We would like to thank our event sponsors today who have worked and, and who have invested in this work. Our co-presenting sponsor is BGSF and Texas Mutual, along with support from our gold sponsors, Southwest Airlines, and silver sponsors, Encore and Capital One. Thank you so much for your very generous support. And now I would like to turn it over to Bill Jackson with our co-presenting sponsor, Texas Mutual, to talk about the format for today's event and to introduce our keynote speaker. All right, thank you, Drex. Again, my name is Bill Jackson, Vice President of Dallas Lubbock Regional Operations at Texas Mutual, which basically is the Northern half of Texas. Great to be with everybody and thank all of you for attending. Texas Mutual is proud to be a co-presenting sponsor for today's virtual gathering of workforce leaders to share their wisdom and insight during such a critical time in our state. Texas Mutual has been a longtime supporter of workforce development strategy in Texas. As the leading provider of workers' compensation in the state, our mission is to create a stronger, safer Texas, which simply means we're committed to developing our future workforce because we know that when businesses are strong and workers are safe, then we all benefit. Today, we're going to hear from state and local workforce leaders on current workforce trends, the impact of COVID-19 on our workforce, and how they are implementing innovative strategies to address workforce needs. So let's talk about our workforce today, or I should say our format. We'll certainly be talking a lot about the workforce. First, we will hear from Texas Workforce Commission Chairman Brian Daniel in a fireside chat with Beth Garvey, President and CEO of BGSF. Following the chat with Commissioner Daniel will be a special announcement from the DRC and commits partnership on a new workforce strategy collaborative for the Dallas community. We will then hear from a panel of distinguished leaders in our region who are at the front lines of workforce development. And then we'll wrap up and we'll all get that done by about 1.30 and be finished by then. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest of honor, Chairman Brian Daniel with the Texas Workforce Commission. Chairman Daniel serves as a representative for the public, promoting and supporting the growth of Texas world-class employers and talented workforce. In this capacity, his office advances innovative workforce and economic development strategies in collaboration with the TWC's education partners, local leaders, and industry to preserve Texas competitive edge as the best place to work in the world. Prior to his appointment, Chairman Daniel served as the executive director of the Office of the Governor of Economic Development. He previously served as vice president for business development at Agricultural Workers Mutual Auto Insurance Company, and as the Texas State Director of Rural Development in President George W. Bush's administration. We are so grateful to have you with us today, Commissioner. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Beth. Thank you, Bill. And we are so happy to have you here, uh, Chairman Daniel. And for those of you, uh, we've had the opportunity to chit chat with him a little bit before we kick this off. And it's been a fascinating conversation and uh, one that I'm sure that we could actually work the whole entire afternoon into because it's it's such a hot topic and something that's so incredibly important for our for um, the state of Texas, especially the North Texas region. So before we dive in, could you um, talk a little bit about the Workforce Commission and what your role is as the commissioner and chairman, please? Sure, uh, glad to, Beth, thanks so much. Bill, thank you for such a kind introduction, Drex, for bringing us all together today. I, it's just a great opportunity for us to talk about some issues that I think are pretty critical for the state and give us an opportunity to explore some things in detail where I think we can all have a fairly immediate impact on the success of this state, both short-term and long-term. So those are pretty exciting things for us to talk about. The Workforce Commission 
uh, as a large agency, we have offices all over the state because we have a lot of different functions. Um, we work in concert with 28 workforce boards, and you'll be hearing from Laurie Larea uh, later on the program. She heads up our efforts uh, there for Dallas. Um, but it's, it's really a partnership between those local boards and the state agency uh, that help us get done all the things that we're doing uh, for Texans. So at the Workforce Commission, you'll find the state's unemployment insurance uh, program. But you'll also find the state's uh, child care uh, programs, adult education and literacy programs, vocational rehabilitation programs for folks um, who may have a disability, and a number of other programs uh, that really help us zero in on uh, groups in Texas that have so much to contribute to the economy, uh, but may need a little different path to get into that workforce. And so uh, we've dedicated a lot of time and resources to really helping us find those pathways and help people get on that track that they want to be on so they can get into the career that they need. Uh, being a commissioner, it, there's three of us, uh, Commissioner Demerson, Commissioner Alvarez, and myself, um, we're appointed by the governor to really set the policy for the agency. But a lot of the day-to-day -day works by our executive director, Ed Cerna, uh, who has a pretty heavy statutory authority uh, to handle most of the operations of the agency. So uh, the three commissioners operate at what I would characterize as a 30,000 foot level. Uh, we ask a lot of questions at the 30 foot level, but we're supposed to be operating at the 30,000 foot level. Uh, and Mr. Cerna, our executive director, uh, really is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of, say, unemployment insurance or, or even child care, something like that. Of course, he has a team of dedicated folks, um, which I think is really proving to be an all-star team during uh, the different things that we're facing right now, as each of those division directors implements uh, the programs that they've got for the state. And so uh, the work that goes on here in Austin at TWC and our other offices around the state, coupled with... Uh, our 28 workforce boards make up what we call workforce solutions, and we intend to be exactly that. Uh, we want to be those solutions for folks who want to be in the workforce doing something that they love so they can earn a living for their family. And really, when that happens, then we see communities being built and we see the future success for the state of Texas continue to look bright. I love that. So much of what you do is so, so impactful to my industry in itself as we put people to work. So it's just, it's not, it's good to know that you have teams of people out there. So let's talk about 2020. It's certainly been a year for, um, that will go down in history. So um, the impact of COVID-19 in the workforce and workforce um, systems. Since March of 2020, there's been 2.9 million Texas, Texans that have um, filed for unemployment. Um, about 27% of that has been in North Texas with close to 800,000 jobs um, or unemployment claims that's happened. So my question for you, there's, it's kind of twofold. So what strategies are the TWC implementing to get those displaced people back to work, A, and B, do you have any thoughts on the need for additional uh, federal unemployment funding? Well, good questions. You know, um, we have successfully completed about just under 6 million initial claims for unemployment insurance benefits uh, since March. Now your number with regard to the number of people is true, the, the number of people smaller than the number of claims. Some folks have had multiple claims. We've seen uh, folks go back to work only to be sent back home again. We've seen folks uh, lose a job, change jobs, and then have that job sent home. We've seen a number of iterations of that. Each and every claim uh, that we take um, opens a, a new case and, and we really have to dig in and understand how through the unemployment insurance system uh, that that person can be helped. Uh, those numbers, um, frankly, have stabilized. They're still uh, much higher than anyone would like for uh, us to have. Uh, they're much higher than we would want to see. And, and some of that's a function of, of the economy sort of lagging behind um, the stress that's been put on it. Um, it. It's stable, but it's not in a condition that we'd like to see it be. So we're continuing to do work. But if we paint a picture of today versus say, where we saw ourselves in April, um, you know, at least at this moment, we're, we're able to implement new programs and bring things online that I think can help the folks that are, are either on unemployment insurance or are concerned that they may be on unemployment insurance benefits uh, moving forward. If you look at April, we had a week in April where we had 437,000 claims filed in one week. Let me just put that in perspective for you. 
the last week of February, which was a pretty normal week, we had 12,000 claims filed. There was a time period in April where the phone was ringing 3,000 times a minute. And uh, our operators are open 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, if you add all that up, uh, the sheer volume of phone calls, it, it, a phone call doesn't last a minute. And so we had to bring in resources from all over our offices and borrow some from some others. Uh, we had a, quite a few legislative staff that were helping us, uh, volunteers. Uh, we were moving people from everywhere we could within our own agency just to answer those phone calls and get answers for folks. We have a little more breathing room now because of uh, upgrades we've made to our computer system, upgrade we've made to our phone system. We've brought in a number of contractors uh, to help with phones, which has put people back to work in what their regular job was. Uh, and that lets me get to kind of the heart of your question, which is, so, so what could I be doing right now uh, to ensure that I could get back in the workforce if I'm not doing that? Number one, the agency has invested uh, a lot of time and money uh, in making online training available for folks uh, who will go through a local workforce board and avail themselves of this training. Uh, we have a, an online platform uh, with a company called Metrics that provides training in so many different skill sets. Uh, so if you're thinking this is a great time for me to, to really find some online training that'll help me polish off my skills and be ready to go when I can get back to work, uh, th that's exactly what it's for. But if you have uh, been in and out of a couple of different jobs during this time period, you're concerned about where you're gonna land next, you might want a new set of skills and you could make that training work uh, to that effect as well. So I, I think for someone who finds themselves um, on unemployment benefits, not sure where they're gonna go next for a job, uh, work on that training. It, it gives you some opportunities to explore some careers that you might not otherwise have thought about. Uh, some folks are working, uh, they may have reduced hours. I, I think training is an appropriate thing for um, people who find themselves in a reduced hour kind of deal. You're employed, you're getting some income. This might be a good chance to, to upgrade your skills to the next level of skills uh, that you may be looking for. There's a number of programs that are still in effect at TABC that always have been, um, particularly if, if you're looking at adult education and literacy components, or you have a disability and you want to work through vocational rehabilitation services. Um, th those uh, offices are open, they're operating. Uh, those are very specialized uh, programs for folks uh, who meet a certain definition. Um, but if, if you feel like that's an area that you need some work in, uh, come see us on that too. When I say come see us, I, I mean virtually, although a lot of our local offices are open up out at the uh, Workforce Development Boards. Uh, go online, uh, check us out. We've got a number of opportunities for folks to plug in uh, to some things that I think can be pretty meaningful uh, for people to be able to get back to work. Well, we are so grateful for the resources that PwC provides, especially during this time right now. So important. So before you became chairman, you served as executive director of the Governor's Economic Development um, Division. Um, can you share how you see the workforce impacting the economic de development of Texas? You know, we got to work with uh, chambers from all over the state when I was in the governor's office working in economic development, because uh, one of the ways we viewed that office was as a workforce extender for the chambers themselves. You know, the economic development teams are going to be as big as the chamber can make it. You know, sometimes that's one person, sometimes it's it's 10 people, um, sometimes it's Mike Rosa who does the, does the job of 10 people. I mean, it's sort of, you know, whatever the situation calls for. But it, it is a, an opportunity um, for the governor's office to provide the exact assistance that a, a chamber group might need when they're talking to a company about either creating new jobs or expanding an operation that's already there, whatever, whatever the situation is. Here's what I observed the entire time I was in that office, which is workforce was never not part of the conversation. It was always a part of the conversation. Maybe not the first part, but it was always going to come up in the first 10 minutes. We believed in 2015 that the reason companies really wanted to locate to Texas was because uh, we had just a, a really stable tax and regulatory structure. We believed it was about the business environment. We believed it was about their ability to be either near their customers or near their competitors, uh, whatever worked for them. And what we learned quickly was is, no, the number one recruiting tool that we have in Texas is our workforce. It is the Texans themselves. The number one retention tool we have is the business environment. 
And so you have to work on those simultaneously. If you have the kind of workforce people are looking for, uh, they will want to be here and they will want to stay here if the state has the kind of business climate uh, that it absolutely needs. And, and, and this proved out time and time again, uh, large companies, large global companies, large global companies that you might use every day, when they engaged with us on expansions in Texas, they brought three different teams to the meeting. They brought their tax team to talk about incentives. They brought their real estate team to talk about location. And they brought their HR team to talk about how we would solve workforce challenges for them. That conversation hasn't changed any in the 18 months since I've been gone from there. In fact, it may have intensified because we've got to keep drilling down to this point where we can produce the workforce that companies need to succeed here. We want them to stay here. We want them to create carrying jobs. 100% of the jobs in the state are created by employers. I know it sounds silly, but 100% of the jobs are created by employers. And for them to create a job, they know there has to be somebody there to take that job. Uh, maybe one of the biggest challenges we face are when there's open jobs and they can't get them filled. And so we spend a lot of time and effort working on that so that people can be aware of those open jobs. But that's exactly how companies have been successful in the state and how I think they're going to continue to contribute to the economy here. I agree. I agree. So um, it's a great segue question. So um, BGSF and the DRC are fierce advocates of workforce development, um, the education and what how employers play a part in that. So what is your vision for how these systems can adapt and adequately prepare the workforce for the future of work that's coming our way? You know, in February, the governor laid out um, a number of charges for uh, the tri-agency work, which is the Workforce Commission, the Higher Education Coordinating Board, and the Texas Education Agency. Our work is, is a tri-agency group. This is version 2.0, 1.0 is in 2016. It's, it's a little bit of a continuation of that conversation, uh, but it was really designed to take us into the future. Uh, early February is when this was laid out and we laid down a strategy to get this done to really have some great conversation and engage employers and others, uh, education providers throughout the state. And then, you know, like a lot of things, COVID, right? So we, we had to make some changes to those plans, but we had the conversations. We, we talked to institutions of higher education. We talked to public schools. We talked uh, to groups that are interested in that, nonprofits and others, and we talked to employers. And uh, we're getting ready to release that report um, here at the, the latter part of this year. And one of, the, one of the previews I would give you from the tri-agency work is, is employers often are so busy doing their business that they can be unaware of the different programs that they would have available to them. Uh, government, this is me talking, but government sometimes has too many programs. It's like going to Luby's when you're hungry. It's an impossible task. And, and so uh, a lot of people will just avoid dealing with it because they can't really decide from all the offerings what they could use to help them be what they wanted to be or, or become you know, what they'd like to become. And I think our role, and frankly, I'll, I'll brag on the workforce boards one more time and, and DRC and some other groups, helping employers break down what's really useful for them. Somebody who can listen and understand this is the problem they're actually trying to solve. Uh, sometimes an employer believes they have one problem in terms of, of talent acquisition, when in reality, it's, it's something that they haven't quite looked at or, or it hasn't come to the forefront in the marketplace. Hey, I don't believe the government can do a better job than an employer understanding their own workforce or talent needs. Uh, but sometimes I can see clearly a picture to help you address that. And the work that we've been doing between uh, secondary schools, post-secondary schools, and, and workforce practitioners is really helping our Texas workforce chart a path to get the credentials of consequence that they need. Uh, and, and then have employers help education providers understand what credentials are necessary. You know, we, we may very well have a situation where people are taking a degree to work in a field that doesn't require that degree. That actually does happen, strangely. 
employers can help us by articulating clearly what they need and plugging in. The tri-agency lets them articulate it to me because they talk to the TWC quite a bit and I can pass it along to the other agencies. Uh, but there's, there's as many avenues to get that information to the people that need it as there are employers out there. And so much of it is relationships that you would form either through your membership in a chamber or your work with one of our local workforce boards, big or small. Whether you have 15,000 employees in Texas or you have 15 employees in Texas, uh, you will get the same level of service. And I uh, work every day making sure that that's concierge level service uh, for both employers and the workforce here in Texas that are trying to make sure those careers take them into the future because uh, Texas will succeed if Texans succeed. And so the focus has to be on Texans, workforce, employers, and those that wanna help them. We've got to stay together on this and continue to communicate with each other so that employers can understand which programs they need, leave the ones they don't, create the jobs they need to create, and then get the talent in there that they need to do it. And I think that's when we'll see communities really be able to rally around that point and move the whole thing forward, which is what we really want to see in the end anyway. I agree. Um, in our earlier conversation, she brought up um, a stat on the middle skills gap that is currently taking place um, that is not really changed. Can you kind of elaborate on what, you, what we talked about in the earlier session and the impact that that has on the communities um, as we continue to try to um, come out of work and what, where, where we can actually be helpful in that area? Absolutely. What we were talking about earlier was this fact. When we uh, hit the new year on January 1st, 2020 in Texas, before we had even ever heard of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2, we knew we had a middle skills gap here in the state. These are jobs that require additional training, sometimes additional experience. Uh, and we knew that, that some employers were really beginning to become concerned about how many people fit that description that they could bring on their, into their talent pool at their company. Now, we estimate that. You can estimate it however you want. I'm going to tell you, uh, at any given time, there was maybe as many as 800,000 jobs that either weren't being created or we were having trouble filling because we, we just simply uh, had so many people employed in the state um, that people weren't necessarily advancing their education or pursuing the next level job because they had a good job. And so we spent a good deal of time looking at this. You know, how do we help people advance their education? How do we help people get the right kind of experience? Because uh, as companies grow, they create the need for more advanced jobs, whether that be management or, or technical services or, or even some professional jobs. Uh, what I've observed during the pandemic is, is that I, companies want to get back to where they were successful. You, you'll see in the news words like new normal and, and unprecedented and, and things like that. Okay, this is, this, this is the first time we've done a pandemic like this. I, I can't really argue with those words. Um, what companies are looking at is how do we be successful? Mm -hmm. How is our bottom line successful? How can we take care of our employees that make that bottom line possible? Um, I find that the, that the need to take care of employees for companies rises high because they understand how economically they're successful in the state. They, meaning employers, I think see a path to where they know they need to be once they can get there. Now, it may look like it did. They may be on the same target path and trajectory. They may realize it's different now. But I, I think that businesses that are gonna be successful have charted out this path. And I, I'm hearing from them that they're still concerned about this same sort of middle skills gap. Um, I didn't really define it earlier, so let me, let me do that now. I mean, this, this, is, uh, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's between entry level and completely uh, what you would characterize as a professional position. So if you take an engineer or a doctor or an accountant. These are professional positions. We know they require certain coursework at the university, certain degree at the university, certain exam that you have to take and, and maintain your license with the state. What I'm talking about jobs that are high demand, high wage, that require some special training 
or skill, but it, but it doesn't rise to the level of needing a four-year degree in engineering or you know eight years of education to be a physician. Uh, what I'm talking about are jobs that someone who's been in the workforce 10 years and with a slight addition to their education uh, and the combination with that 10 years that they've been working in a particular field, it makes them, uh, moves them into uh, maybe what we would call middle management or moves them into a technical services position uh, where they, they operate autonomously, independently, but, but working for a company. Uh, it, if I were to characterize it in my own words, it, it really moves you up the ladder, the career ladder, uh, a, 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 into what I think is a better situation for anyone. Less people telling you what to do, the opportunity to earn more wages based on what you have accomplished in your experience and your education here in the state. I'm concerned about this. I, I think it's the future of how Texas continues to grow our economy. Uh, I, I, um, I remember a couple of years ago, I was getting ready to go on a recruiting trip uh, to a, a major city here in the United States. Uh, as I was meeting with the Consul General of Australia, and I apologize to him because I need to go to the airport because I, I had to get on a flight. And uh, his comment was, he says, I, I find it hard to believe that Texas still has to engage in, in going out to see companies. Uh, and my answer was, is I was in sales for a number of years. Um, you really don't get your customers if you don't engage with your customers. Uh, and, and, and so it's true. Texas, no matter how successful we have been economically, uh, we were setting records for total employment, unemployment rates, everything in February. Uh, but we find ourselves in a different situation in November. And, and we understand that the old problems are still the problems. And we need to continue to find solutions to those while we're doing some kind of pandemic uh, response over here at the same time. And so we work on those together. Uh, I, I think that the educational offerings are in place. I think that folks have good workforce experience. I, I think uh, where we can be most helpful is helping people again chart that pathway to match that education with that workforce experience and take that to the next level and find that promotion uh, that's really going to solidify them in the career that they've chosen. Yeah. So one of the things I love about being part of the DRC is the, the amount of uh, businesses that we have in this region. It is a powerful group of people who move the needle and make things happen um, willingly and helpfully and share their knowledge throughout um, the community. So with that, um, you know, you just give this group something to talk about and they're going to try to solve it. So the three things that keep you up at night on the workforce of today and what are some actionable things that the business community can do to help move the needle and get us where we need to be? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I would kind of organize it like this into short term, uh, middle term, and long term. So three things I'm concerned about. On the, on the short term basis, I, I'm probably most concerned about getting people back to work. Um, whether it's in the field they were in or they're choosing a new field, um, they've, they've done some training that we've been able to offer during this, this time period. But short term, uh, I think we need to move people back into employment. In, in an organized and safe way um, so that employers and, and the businesses that uh, create those jobs uh, can really chart their path forward. It's not as easy as it sounds. There's, there's COVID protocols to deal with. There's um, sort of marketplace needs for companies. Jobs have changed. There's new jobs. Old jobs don't exist anymore. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of turmoil in, in, in the sense that the disruption that's been made to what we all understood uh, it's not well understood yet, but I, I think we're starting to get a handle on it. Where, <clears throat> excuse me, where I think that um, we could be useful uh, from the TWC standpoint is that if we can help play that matchmaker where we can know the workforce, we can know the companies, <clears throat> and then make those introductions so that folks can get back to work, I think that's pretty useful for us. In the, in the middle term, I think upward mobility for workers remains what's critical for us. <clears throat> and allergy pills for me would be very helpful. It is the season, that's for sure. <laughs> <It is. clears throat> 
So in the middle term, it's back to that middle skills gap that we're talking about and an opportunity for us to help people advance their careers. And then in, in the long term is understanding the flight path for employers and understanding how to put that together, <coughs> excuse me, so that a community can move itself forward. And, and so they're all related, but it's different segments and different timing on each one that's gonna help us get to where we need to go. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you, Chairman, for your thoughtful discussion today. It's been very insightful, and um, I, I, Texas allergies can be a pain in the honey, but <laughs> that's where we live, and we're happy about it. Yes, so yeah. now I'd like to introduce Drexel Awusu, a Senior Vice President of Education and Workforce at the Dallas Regional Chamber, and Todd Williams, Chairman of the Commit Partnership for a special announcement. Well, thank you, Beth, uh, and thank you, Commissioner or Chairman Daniel, uh, for that fantastic discussion on uh, the pressing workforce issues uh, in the state of Texas. Uh, I think it's pretty clear uh, that our success as a state, and, and certainly in Dallas, uh, for, for the region of Dallas, uh, are closely tied to the success of our workforce. Um, over the last, uh, well, more than a few months at this point, uh, Todd and I have been uh, working closely together with Boston Consulting Group. Uh, and a diverse coalition of educators, community advocates, employers to really focus on a singular question, which is uh, to, to the chairman's question or point, um, what will it take to really drive living wage or middle skill attainment uh, using our existing systems? Uh, and for me and the DRC, this work uh, has taken on additional meaning and urgency and focus uh, given the systematic uh, systemic uh, inequities in our community that have been highlighted by COVID. Uh, so today, uh, we're excited to launch uh, a new community effort called Dallas Thrives with a bold goal of doubling living wage attainment for young adults and equitably eliminating racial gaps uh, in a single generation. Uh, by giving a, an equal likelihood uh, of earning a living wage uh, for everybody, uh, where race and place are no longer an indicator of success, uh, we'll be helping Dallas live up to its ideal of being the best place for all people to live, work, and do business. Dallas has experienced tremendous job growth over the last decade, but that growth has not been shared equally. Today, less than one in four young adults in Dallas earn a living wage. Even more troubling, black and Hispanic young adults are three times less likely than their white peers to earn a living wage. Relative to the other large urban counties across Texas, Dallas has the deepest living wage inequality by race. The data is clear. Education and a good job are key steps in achieving economic mobility. 85% of current jobs in Dallas that pay a living wage or higher require some education or formal training beyond a high school diploma, yet, only 39% of Dallas young adults have an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, or equivalent professional training. And COVID-19 has only further magnified and expanded those inequalities in our education and workforce system. During the COVID-19 crisis across all age groups, approximately 75% of all unemployment claimants in Dallas County do not have a post-secondary credential. Leaders across Dallas recognize the importance of addressing these challenges. That's why we have come together to launch an ambitious new effort. Dallas Thrives aims to double the number of young adults earning a living wage in a single generation and ensure we achieve this ambitious goal with racial equity in our community. This goal requires broad action from educators, business leaders, and community leaders to prepare all Dallas students for success in the classroom and the workforce. Doing so will drive strategic advantage for Dallas, attracting more employers and shifting opportunities in the region to higher skilled, better paying jobs. Together, we can make our city a model for racial equity and economic resilience. Hi, I'm uh, Todd Williams, and I'm blessed to serve as the chairman and CEO of the Commit Partnership, and we are absolutely thrilled to be partnering today with the Regional Chamber and others in this important endeavor. 
Um, the goal of equitably doubling living wage attainment is not an easy one, but it's one that we're all committed to and striving towards. It's gonna to require all of us to do what we can to try and collectively own the outcome for every Dallas County student. Creating a talent pool that becomes a regional strategic advantage, enabling us to attract more jobs while also shifting the mix of jobs toward higher skill and higher pay work. We know that automation and events like the 2008 Great Recession and COVID-19 only, are only gonna to continue to disrupt lower paying jobs that require less education and training. And part of making Dallas Thrive's a success is making our community a leader in providing our residents with the skill sets and competencies required by the modern workforce. To accomplish this, we have to do a much better job of bridging the silos so that K-12 and higher ed are absolutely clear on what employers need and employers are much more actively engaged in helping shape curriculum and providing mentorships and internships that level the playing field to give everyone an informed shot at a prosperous career. As Drex noted with Boston Consulting Group's help, we've identified five big strategic moves to jumpstart our effort. These moves will incorporate multiple initiatives that will collectively build upon each other to move the needle on living wage attainment. The first move is focused on a workforce pipeline alignment, making sure that the region's top priority living wage jobs and career paths and the competencies that they require uh, are informing both curriculum in K-12 and in higher ed, as well as student pathway selections. The second big goal is career exploration and guidance, expanding career exposure earlier, starting as uh, early as middle school and providing better pathway guidance to inform student and parent choices. The third is college career readiness, credential attainment and placement, growing and supporting the number and percentage of young adults earning credentials and job placement that lead to a living wage through scaling such innovative programming already occurring here in Dallas, such as early college, P-TECH, career and technical high schools, and the Dallas County Promise. Fourth are connections to the workforce, substantially increasing uh, our efforts to provide all students and young adults with the necessary work experiences, networks, and coaching to achieve job placement in their desired living wage careers. And last, but certainly not least, is employer investment, significantly increasing the number of employers who are actively engaged in strengthening the local talent pool and otherwise supporting and growing the talent pipeline. We've already built strong momentum and buy-in for this work. Over 60 organizations uh, from across business, government, education, nonprofit have all agreed to the urgency of the work and the vision that has been outlined. It's gonna take everyone in the community to make this a success. Uh, businesses, educators, policymakers, and community leaders. We formed a governing board of 25 community leaders that's gonna meet quarterly to hold all of ourselves accountable for measuring progress, innovating, and identifying gaps. We're also very pleased and grateful that initial philanthropic supports uh, seeding this effort have been generously provided by national and local funders such as J.P. Morgan Chase, the Dallas College Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Capital One, and Bloom Meridian Partners. J. Eric Johnson, the fabled co-founder of Texas Instruments and beloved mayor of Dallas during the 1960s, said on the anniversary of JIK's death, our efforts should be to build our city, not necessarily into a bigger one, but always into a better one, to produce those elements of background, education, of training, of discipline, of straightforward thinking uh, at the future as a goal to be achieved at a high level throughout our efforts. Together, we can make our city a model for racial equity and economic resilience. And now, I would like to turn it over to one of Dallas Thrive's initial investors and State of the Workforce Silver sponsor, Capital One, to talk about why their company is committed to this community vision. Awesome. Thank you, Drexel and Todd, for that exciting announcement. Uh, I love that. It sounds like a 90s crime fighting duo, duo Drexel and Todd. <laughs> it's fantastic. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Tim Mullins. Uh, I'm the vice president for Capital One Auto Finance. And we are very proud uh, to be an early investor in Dallas Thrives. Uh, at Capital One, uh, we embrace the idea that by advancing the economic and social opportunities in the communities in which we operate, uh, we can advance business outcomes while helping people thrive. And I really love that word, thrive. You know, socioeconomic mobility is one of the most pervasive and long standing issues in our society. You know, we believe in, in disparities in housing and education and employment, among other key factors, create inequities 
in a person's financial health and overall well-being. Uh, in support of our mission to change banking for good, we recently launched the Capital One Impact Initiative to advance socioeconomic mobility by catalyzing economic growth in low and moderate income communities and, and really closing gaps in, in, in equity and, and, and opportunity. We're deeply engaged uh, in workforce development programs across the footprints, uh, providing opportunities for individuals who face impediments to unleash their potential and thrive in a, in a rapidly changing uh, employment market. Uh, companies and communities play an important role here you know, to, to reach that ambitious goal to double uh, the living wage attainment in a generation is going to require uh, private sector, government sector, and volunteer sectors to come together uh, and build communities that really thrive. Uh, that is why we're excited to hear from uh, our panel of leaders today who are committed to, uh, to doing this work together. So I'd love to, to hand it over now to Elizabeth Cottle McLean, uh, Managing Director of Higher Education and Workforce at the DRC and co-lead for the Dallas Thrive Initiative uh, to moderate our panel. Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Tim, uh, for being here today and for Capital One's investment in this work. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, I am so excited to be a Dallas Thrive co-lead representing the DRC with Commit Representative and co-lead Carrie O'Connor, as am I excited to moderate this distinguished panel today. Thank you to Chairman Daniel and Beth for a fantastic conversation. I would love to go ahead and introduce our panels today as we welcome them to the screen. First, we have Lori Larea, who serves as the President and CEO of Workforce Solutions Greater Dallas. Under her leadership, Workforce Solutions Dallas has exceeded multiple goals in expanded service to employers, including upskilling, administration of both adult education and childcare subsidies, and focus on quality care for our future workforce. Service to the Dallas workforce system has proved a rewarding pursuit, extending Lori's current workforce to more than 40 years. She knows what she's talking about. Work for Solutions Dallas maintains excellence in the direction of Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, SNAP, and TANF activities, all contributing to a better workforce for Dallas County. Next, uh, I'd like to welcome Ben McGill, who serves as the Associate Vice Chancellor of Economic Opportunity at Dallas College. Ben represents Dallas College in economic development and economic opportunity initiatives and oversees the strategic direction of the Labor Market Intelligence Center and the Employment Resource Center. Ben has worked in economic and workforce development for municipalities and chambers of commerce in North Texas since 2009. He recently graduated from the Dallas Economic Opportunity Leadership Academy and serves on the board of Impact Ventures and Big Design. Next, we have Wenji Tang Mayo. She is the Senior Executive Vice President and Chief Experience Officer for Texas Health Resources. In this role, she brings consumer and operational experience to both the core business transformation and new business creation, including strategy and research and development for Texas Health. In 2013, she was honored with the Outstanding Achievement Award from the U.S. Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce Southwest Region. She has been named by Becker's Hospital Review as one of the 130 women in hospital and health system leaders to know and 25 healthcare leaders under the age of 40. And then last, but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome our final panelist, Dr. DeAndre Weaver, who serves as the superintendent of schools at DeSoto Independent School District. He is a Southside Chicago native who has been described as strategic, visionary, and forward thinking among the national education community. Driven by the desire to help others realize their dreams, Dr. Weaver has been recognized throughout his career for improving student achievement. His educational focus centers on equity, access, and transformational education initiatives. Under Dr. Weaver's leadership, DeSoto ISD experienced a 12-point gain in the district's accountability rating, according to the Texas Education Agency. In addition, Dr. Weaver and his leadership team have led an organizational redesign effort to improve the employment and educational experiences of staff and students in DeSoto ISD, placing an emphasis on establishing a culture of continual improvement and learning, collective genius, and system-wide alignment and collaboration. I am so excited to have all of you here today. Clearly, it's going to be a phenomenal discussion with uh, the knowledge and leadership we have together. Um, before we get going, I just want to remind all of our audience to submit any questions for the panel in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. After we dig in a little bit deeper, we want to ask your question. So make sure you put it in the chat and we will make sure those get asked. So let's begin. 
Tell us one thing about your organization that your audience may not know. And let's go in the order of introduction, starting with Lori. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was you. well done, very well done getting through all those bios. <laughs> Uh, one thing about our organization, I, we are not the Texas Workforce Commission, we are a partner. We are Workforce Solutions Greater Dallas. That's always confusing, uh, but it's worth the explanation. And I guess the most important thing is employers are our primary customer. Without employers, there's not a lot of places to send a job seeker. So uh, just want to point out, we have 80,000 businesses in the Dallas County community. Um, maybe a third of those have heard of us. So for whatever today brings, please, please let people know we're here to serve the Dallas employers. And we have a lot of tools and skills and definitely a lot of people on the unemployment rolls to send. So that would be hopefully something everybody takes with them. Wonderful, thank you. Ben, how about you? Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, two quick things. One, we recently moved um, from seven separately accredited colleges to one college. Uh, hence the name change to Dallas College. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that uh, you may not know is that we now offer a, a bachelor's degree in early childhood education, which started in fall 2020 uh, with the lower uh, level classes and then continuing uh, with, the, with the new um, baccalaureate level classes starting in fall 2021. Wonderful and very important to workforce development and childcare and early childhood education. Wingy. Good afternoon. Well, many of you know Texas Health is one of the largest healthcare providers um, in the country and in the region. Um, you know, we have hospitals and clinics and urgent cares and all sorts of services. What you may not know, though, is that as a as one of the largest faith-based not-for-profit health systems, um, we have a very bold initiative to invest in our community health and community health improvement by awarding cross-sector -sec collaborative grants, addressing local needs in innovative ways. And we call this Texas Health Community Impact. And um, across our communities, um, we are calling on agencies from different sectors in the communities to unite against identified health issues. Oftentimes we call those the social determinants of health. And very specifically right now with COVID, um, we are part of a significant study aimed at learning more about how the virus is spreading and why certain people are more affected than others. Um, as and um, we're participating in the DFW COVID-19 prevalence study with our friends at UT Southwestern. Wonderful, thank you so much. Dr. Weaver. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, many people know we have uh, a Super Bowl MVP. Uh, some people know we have uh, two Pulitzer uh, winners, uh, but not many people know that we actually this year have a Grammy nominated teacher. So our choir teacher, is currently uh, Grammy nominated and is a finalist. Uh, so we're all pulling for her um, uh, this year. Wonderful, thank you so much. I learned a lot even through all of that, so thank you. Uh, I, I know that we touched on this a little bit, especially with the chairman, but kind of the big topic issue is COVID-19. It has changed the way we do everything, including this event, which is now online and virtual. So to our workforce and education institutions, could you talk a little bit about how this has changed um, your, your organization, your plans, and how you're really addressing this crisis while trying to educate and support students? Let's start with Ben. Thanks, Elizabeth. I think, you know, number one, safety is, you know, is a, the, the, the most, uh, most important. And so, you know, starting back in spring of last year, uh, we transferred all of our uh, courses online, uh, you know, almost 100% of those courses online, obviously, you know, a handful of those programs and, and things that have to be done in person, we're trying to do that as, as safe as possible. Um, and, you know, really just trying to, um, you know, focus on safety without decreasing access, we have to continue to focus on access and make sure no one is missing out on the opportunity to uh, take advantage of those classes and continue their continue their education and uh, help you know find a new job in many cases reskill or upskill. Um, so it, it's it's two things. It's one number one is definitely safety, uh, but number two is maintaining that access to education to all of our opportunities. Absolutely, Dr. Weaver. 
want to second Ben. Uh, this past spring, when we started our planning for COVID-19, uh, we started it with the end in mind. And the end in mind for us was that we're not going back to the way that we uh, started or the way that we were prior to COVID. And although it is not ideal for us to educate uh, many of our children, especially our most vulnerable and, and those that need us the most uh, remotely, uh, we do see a lot of promise in our ability to leverage technology in a way um, that we've not done it before to reach more students and provide a much more personalized um, experience for, for kids. So I think heading into 2021 and beyond, you know, we're looking to capitalize on the advance of technology in ways that we've been able to be more efficient uh, while also trying to learn ways to uh, better make connections with students, uh, whether they're in front of us or outside or, or remote. Um, and I think similarly, uh, some of the bigger challenges have been you know, how do we uh, love one children when they're not in front of us? How do we, you know, pay attention to those cues and those signs that we would uh, pay attention to if they're in front of us? Let us know that something is not going well. But how do you teach uh, reading to a first grader, um, you know, who's on a, a, a short Zoom? So we're trying to answer some of those very, very big uh, um, problems, uh, questions, um, and, um, and, and trying to keep our people alive while doing it. Absolutely. That's, Huge. Um, I know that we've heard from various education institutions this fear of students feeling isolated in isolation as they're going through things like this. Lori, from, from your perspective, how has this impacted y'all? Well, I think the, the theme is safety and vir virtual tools. Um, we have become much more outward facing. It, it's been an interesting metamorphosis. It really has. Our people are used to having people in the queue coming in the office. Uh, we have eight locations and everybody coming in. Now our people are at home working from home in most cases, and they're having to pivot out, find the customer, bring that job seeker customer in, and then find out what they need. And I think that is the critical issue. Is there enough connectivity to find out the need in our community? I'll tell you right now, with the adult learner, this is a hard, hard situation. We are administering adult education in ESL, uh, thankful to the college and thankful to the Wilkinson Center and the ISDs in Irving and Richardson for getting it done and getting people online. But there's a lot of scenarios where the persistence lags because the adult has so many distractions, very much uh, what Dr. Weaver was talking about, how do you keep that momentum going on the learning cycle with all of the troubles and problems and the fact everybody's on the same internet? <laughs> we hear this a lot. <laughs> it's like, I can't do business and do my education and educate my kids. Um, the great adaptability of our teams, I'm just so impressed. Uh, the fact that they learned new skills, they brought it forward. So we're developing our workforce, which is rather massive. At the same time, we are developing the people who need to work. Um, our biggest difference is our job fairs. We miss our job fairs. This is our labor exchange function, which is huge for us. And this time we had a platform, it's highly produced, it's awesome. And we've been able to hold probably seven to eight major job fairs. Uh, the one last week featured 6,000 jobs. Um, easy access, nobody has to drive, nobody has to park. Uh, you can decide the day before and just log in. And then we're fronting that with Facebook Live and featuring HR directors so that they can be telling people about their jobs and creating more of a, a, a much more of a connection than we ever did in public. People actually feel like they've met this director and they know their name and they can call and say, oh, I saw you on Facebook and I want to talk to you. Uh, so for all of the, the hard stuff, there's been some wonderful moments and pieces we pull together. They're just, we'd have never gone here without it. Wow. That's incredible to hear that number, you know, of, of number of folks who are attending and able to connect. Um, I, I want to hear from Wendy, your perspective as an employer, uh, especially a healthcare employer, how has COVID-19 impacted your, your workforce and, and your needs? And yeah. Sure. Well, you know, since the first COVID patient walked through our doors on March 9th, our workforce has really been on the front line of this pandemic. And our goal, um, much like many of the themes that have been echoed already here, we're really to keep everybody safe, our staff and our patients, um, give everybody access, um, 
especially our patients, um, and utilize technology to do that, and really support all of our employees who have worked tirelessly since March with no end in sight. Um, you know, we've stood up all sorts of new capabilities much faster than we originally expected, whether that was telemedicine um, and the ability for our family members to be able to connect to our patients in different ways since they're limited in who can go into the facility today. So from a technology standpoint, really um, <laughs> training not just our own staff, but also patients and their families in how to utilize the technology. And then we really wanted to support our workforce. Um, our workforce is the heart of who we are. Um, and since April, we've been providing additional support and resources for all of our employees, including childcare, um, hotel discounts, financial support, food resources, um, where to find grocery delivery and free meals for children. Um, we're providing them caregivers so that um, they can make sure their kids are getting educated and, you know, being on that Zoom call when they need to, but also being able to work that shift at work. and. Um, I really, I really want to take an opportunity. I know we have a lot of businesses and communities who are on this call, and I, I really want to take a moment to say thank you um, to the community who have supported our hospital teams with meals and messages and support. Um, you know, you've donated to COVID relief funds and our employee relief funds. And in this moment, with cases and hospitalizations growing faster today than any other time in our region, um, our clinicians are needing that support more than ever. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, um, we are also very proud to say we have not had any layoffs or any furloughs um, due to COVID-19. Um, and um, we remain really committed to our workforce and their families and are even adding some additional benefits in 2021. Wow, thank you. Well, and thank you to, to everything that you're doing and the frontline healthcare workers. Uh, I, I, I know I can speak for our community that we are happy to support you in this time because you always support us. So um, kind of shifting gears a little bit, uh, the, the demographics of Texas are rapidly changing with a projection of over 63% of the state workforce being black or Latinx by 2030. We also know that the Texas Workforce Commission projects that over 60% of jobs by 2030 will require some form of post-secondary credential or training. Yet, as we heard in the video earlier, Black and Latinx young adults are three times less likely to earn a living wage than their white counterparts. How are your organizations specifically addressing educational access, workforce readiness for Black and Latinx citizens? How about we start with you, Dr. Weaver? Yeah, I was gonna say, I'll jump in there first. Um, I, I'm excited because DeSoto ISD uh, we serve uh, a pretty large population of, of uh, children of, of color, black and brown students, black and Latinx students, I remember clearly over 98%. Um, and one of the ways that we've been think, thinking differently about this problem uh, is uh, we think that in order to truly solve this problem, we have to work in collaboration with other partners and institutions. And so we uh, wrote a grant and was funded to create a joint strategic plan with Methodist Charlton Hospital, with UNT Dallas, with the city of DeSoto, city of Glen Heights for collective impact. So we believe that if we can start to affect um, our uh, future students at the moment of conception through retirement, if we have a collective impact plan um, that solves for people in our area, then we'll be much better to, um, to address some of uh, some of these um, some of these challenges that have historically been uh, in our state in our system for for a long time, um, and, um, and 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 we think a, a much more con concerted approach um, affecting not just the academic um, part of of students' uh, experience, but also their mental health, their families' well being, ensuring that their parents are uh, are learning and employed, um, and to ensure that any. Um, past traumas that uh, students may have experienced um, to get dealt with in, um, in a productive way. Um, all of that goes into readiness. Um, all of that goes into making sure that kids are ready um, for, for learning. In addition to the early childhood kind of zero to five strategy um, that is already kind of in place uh, in, in, in our county. Specifically in our school system, what we're preparing for, and I think Tom, uh, Williams mentioned this earlier, um, and it's a really novel idea to have your 
um, a job and workforce, work with your universities, work with your communities to identify what kids should know, understand, and be able to do to be successful in the workforce. Um, so we want to take that idea and create these competencies that are pre-K through 12 uh, that have um, been vetted and uh, we have contributions from the end result. And then we want to teach stu students beyond the TEKS. We want to make sure that kids know how to manage their emotional intelligence, which in any job, you got to know how to show up and how to deal with conflict and know how to solve problems and how to work with people. You got to understand your cultural background and your experiences and how you show up. So for our Black and Latinx students, if they show up in spaces that are predominantly white, you know, how do you show up in those spaces and not um, feel like an outsider, not feel like you uh, should not be there and, uh, and to not feel like you have to represent for your entire race um, because you're at the table. Um, like when and where do we teach those skills? You know, when do we teach uh, people how to regulate their emotions or um, how to, um, you know, solve problems? And so we think that an educational system in the 21st century in this moment needs to be very explicit about teaching students how to be great people, how to be amazing workers, how to advocate for themselves uh, and to elevate what some consider soft skills, which are really real life skills to navigate yourselves, your relationships in and your jobs. And we think that students should learn that in addition to the TEKS and they should do it in a system that promotes mastery of concepts and skills and those competencies and not uh, let's hurry up and learn because we have to prepare for an exam, which is important, um, but it is not the end all be all. So we think a much more holistic approach uh, to preparing students to be successful um, is, is needed. And, and we're looking to, to do that in DeSoto ISD. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I, I think I'm gonna go down the pipeline going to Dallas College next and hear from Ben uh, of kind of what is Dallas College doing in this space for black and Latinx students? Yeah, well, I mean, that was fantastic, DeAndre. And I, I just would echo all of that and just also say that, um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it takes a, a good crisis to create the kind of innovation and collaboration that we're talking about today. Um, obviously, these were issues, uh, big, big problems here prior to COVID. And I think, you know, the circumstances now have just exacerbated all of that. So it's, it's more important than ever that each of us do more uh, individually and with, you know, the organizations that we represent, uh, you know, doing the very best that we can as, as educators, uh, you know, in Dallas College, uh, and which is what we'll continue to do, uh, will still not be enough if we're only focused on education. You know, we have to think about the whole student, uh, where the circumstances they're coming from, you know, what are they, what are the socioeconomic barriers they're facing to, to staying in class, to getting to class? And, you know, how do we efficiently work with our ecosystem partners to address those challenges? Um, you know, just an example of some of the things we've been doing recently with the launch of the emergency aid fund uh, where students, you know, and the number one, uh, for example, the number one request through that has been uh, for housing assistance, you know, so that is showing up really big on our radar. Um, things like help with uh, childcare, with food, you know, uh, all of, you know, with healthcare, all of these things we, that we know are barriers. And we've got to start addressing that, uh, start addressing and, and helping the whole student, taking a holistic approach, as DeAndre said. So we're, we're doing everything in our power uh, to do that and to, you know, in this time of transformation for us as an organization, rethink how we do that uh, in a better way. Absolutely. Lori. Uh, just a perfect segue. Uh, we can't do a lot with workforce investment dollars in the K through 12 space, but we've had great, great success partnering with Promise. Dallas Promise has a fabulous uh, website, uh, collegeworks.org. It's awesome. And kids and families can work together to figure out how to plan for the future. Um, as you've heard me say, number of times, work makes life happen. And our population, the people who come to us as job seekers, two years ago, it was 67% Black or African American, it's now 69%. Things are not changing rapidly enough. I can't say enough about Dallas Thrive because the focus now is on the wages, making families self-sufficient. And that's what we need in the Dallas market. So our effort is to inform to talk to 
real job seekers who have real problems and communicate that. Uh, as you know, we manage the uh, child care dollars. Um, child care is here for working families. The needs cannot be met. We were up to 16,000 kids in care before the, the change. Um, one, one great ray of hope, great. And I had no idea this was out there because it's not what we're looking at. We're looking at unemployment rates, right? We've gained 14,000 jobs in Dallas County since February. 14,000 more people working, not just job creation, actually people working. So our workforce expanded, um, but we got to see those wages. We've got to see, what do we want in Dallas? We want a strong majority middle class, people who can actually afford life and the connectivity and the food on the table. That's the change we all need to contribute to. So I love everybody's piece of this, but our, our will be to continue our path, more training. Um, we thank you, Walmart Foundation has done so many good things for us in teaching us a little more about upskilling while people work and doing it all technologically. And the Dallas College jumped right in. They have, we're, we're learning now to offer it all online so that people can work and learn without the commute, and without the childcare problems. Those are the kinds of strategies we've all got to um, embrace because people cannot stop earning to figure out how to get more later. They're barely treading water now. And so it's very important that we train people where they are, meet them where they are, get them the credentials because good paying jobs come with investment in yourself. Thank you for that, Lori. And absolutely, that's why a key component of Dallas Thrives is that living wage, um, not just I mean, employment is the road to living wage, but what is the actual wage and how are we creating ladders to ensure that folks are not just meeting living wage, but exceeding it to higher wage jobs. So, Linji, your perspective as an employer, um, I, I know that uh, Texas Health Resources is very engaged in the community and in the pipeline. So kind of what is your perspective on this? Yeah, you know, we, from a student standpoint, we've always had a number of affiliation agreements with colleges and universities and partnerships with workforce agencies across the Metroplex to aid in the placement and training of diverse individuals. Um, recently, though, we've really recognized that we need to do more to drive equity into our communities. And um, one of the ways that we're doing that is really going further upstream to drive awareness and access to health professions. Because if you have never seen somebody who does that job, you don't even know that it's a possibility for you. And so a great example of that is at one of our facilities, Texas Health Dallas, um, we are participating in a new STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math educational initiative in collaboration with Dallas ISD and Emmett J. Conrad High School. Um, more than seven, 70 Conrad high-tech allied health students are learning about different career pathways um, in healthcare. And the collaboration is really part of a national workplace program designed to create partnerships between local school districts and healthcare industry partners. Um, and I really want to echo something that Lori was talking about in terms of being able to create those ladders um, so that, um, uh, you know, once you're out of school, adult learners also have the opportunity to grow as well. And I think the way um, that, you know, we've had at Texas Health a robust tuition reimbursement program for a long time. So as an employee, you can come in at a certain level and there's tuition reimbursement to help you get to um, that next level. Um, I, you know, we've also then, while you're in school, have all these clinical affiliation agreements and internships within our facilities um, where you can then continue to grow as well. And recently with some of the new technology um, platforms that we've implemented, we've created um, certification ladders. So whether that's Salesforce or other tools where you can get certifications in different software platforms and technologies to grow your career. Um, we think that's a huge opportunity um, that we're just starting you know, to, to get into. And then finally, you know, we know that student loan debt is something that um, many, many um, people face. Um, and I'm excited to say that in 2021, we added a new benefit um, where we will support our employees who are coming in with student loan debt and paying off their loans um, on a every pay period basis. 
Wow, that's incredible. Thank you so much for being an organization that is forward thinking and wanting to implement these strategies to better support uh, our workforce and our community. So I, I have one more question before we go to Q&A. So a reminder, if you haven't submitted your questions yet in the chat, please do so below. And we'll make sure that we ask as many as possible. So a big component of Dallas Thrives is not necessarily to create new programs, but to weave together the programs that are existing, to weave together the work that you all are already doing really well. So could you all talk a little bit about how you partner with other organizations, how you're working with each other, uh, and, and kind of how can we better fill that gap together under Dallas Thrives. So Winji, I'm gonna take it back to you if you don't mind. Yeah, I think the example I shared um, is a perfect example of education coming together with partner you know, industry to fill that pipeline. Um, specifically for healthcare, you know, Texas is expected to need almost 16,000 more nurses by 2030. And 120,000 more physicians by 2030 in the U.S. And so when you think about those are definitely living wage jobs, right? How do we um, work with um, the other leaders on this, this call to identify who are those individuals who have both the, the drive and the promise um, to, to um, be able to fill that pipeline, identify them early and support them throughout their journey from being a student all the way through to you know, secondary education, all the way through and then be able to get that um, first job and then to continue to learn in the future. Um, we're also focusing on recruitment and retention um, in rural and underserved communities as well, um, specifically for physicians and programs um, specifically identified for those who are um, willing to go into those communities. How do we support them as they're going through schooling? Because we know many times those aren't the most lucrative positions, but we know that they need to be filled. Um, and having partners like the people on this call, having a program like Dallas Thrives, who will help us identify individuals early on um, and jointly then supporting them through will be essential. Wonderful, thank you. Lori. I think it's wonderful to have the Dallas Thrive table, uh, as we learned with CPAL, uh, Child Poverty Action Labs. You don't know what you don't know. So it's a lot about the convening of the information. It's about sharing and then giving way a bit to say that let's choose one thing and let's hunker down on one thing, as opposed to everybody has their own niche uh, I'm hoping it will influence investors. I know it will influence our public investment through our board. Um, there's also the sharing of data and resource that we've, and, and Ben is a good partner, so is the chamber. We're doing data together. We're sharing software. We're, we're learning how to be collaborative in that. So it's saving money on one end, but it's sharing information on the other. Not that this is rocket science, but you've got to create the table which Thrive creates that then makes it consistently shared and accountable. And I think that is what we learned at CPAL as well. So I'm thrilled to have the mechanism to see that we are all uh, sharing the data and the information consistently. Things will happen, things will pull together. Um, I think on our side, the revenue that we are investing, the, the tax dollars that we're investing, we never stopped. We wrote training scholarships since March, all the way through for adult learners. But it, it now comes down to making more uh, core investments in things like, when she was mentioning the nursing shortage, making that career ladder start happening right now. Uh, the other side of it is some automation issues that are definitely out there. Um, the, the other thing I know is the entrepreneur. So many people are creating jobs out of the necessity of the day. And yet we're not looking at reinforcing those yet. But I think those are some of the things that we will begin to talk about around the Thrive Table that may lead us to more creative solutions. And we won't all be doing something different to get the same outcome. I hope for that too. That's the goal. Uh, ben, do you want to talk a little bit uh, kind of to Lori's point about the data component and how we're all working together? I would love to, as you can imagine. <laughs> Very exciting time. So just to kind of lay out the example, uh, what we've been doing as part of the uh, workforce pipeline alignment work, one of those 
big buckets, right? With Dallas Thrives is using, uh, let's say, um, using some work uh, with DISD, looking at, you know, how do we connect uh, a career pathway all the way from that K-12 through Dallas College and into four-year institutions, uh, starting at the very beginning by sharing that employer demand, right? By looking at that labor market data, by doing the, you know, analyzing the, the online job postings, really understanding what is that employer demand both now and into the future and building programs long-term to, to serve those employer needs and to give our students the very best opportunity at a living wage job, right? To really thrive. Um, so we're, for the first time, we're all around the table, you know, using that work as an example, uh, making sure that we're all on the same page and that the work is, is driven by the demands out there. So really excited about where that's headed. Awesome, and thank you for your leadership and time in doing that as well. Dr. Absolutely. Weaver. Yes, I think um, influencing what kids learn, number one, if we want a different outcome, we gotta influence the inputs. And right now our inputs are not um, aligned to the types of jobs that we want our kids to feel, hence all the shortages. Um, I also think uh, influencing around the products that are used to demonstrate learning and mastery. Uh, you know, we have a goal of, of one day having our 10th graders learn geometry, uh, not because we love geometry and we think and we know that they're going to need it later in life. Um, but by the end of the semester, we want them to build a house for students or for families that are in need in their community. Um, and so so utilizing the workforce uh, to um, integrate with learning so much so that the outcomes that students um, produce are really are genuinely pr uh, preparation uh, for future skills and jobs that they'll need um, uh, later. I think partner with districts to, part, to provide place-based learning opportunities and internships and apprenticeships for students. I cannot tell you how important that is for our students to have um, intentional opportunities to be in the work environments in which we want them to be in later. Uh, is one of the reasons why you know I feel so blessed to be where I am because very early on, I was in the environments working with the people. And the last point is to be intentional about connecting students in professional networks. Many of us have strong networks and some of us got our jobs because of our networks. Our students are missing out on that capital and we have to be intentional, intentional about creating those opportunities and spaces for kids to have professional networks so they can learn so much of the, the hidden curriculum of being successful in workforce. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think this is just the tip of the iceberg of the types of things that our panel and also Dallas Thrives will be digging into. For more information, you can go to DallasThrives.com to follow along as we continue to announce updates, get involved in various other things. So I'm going to dig into Q&A. It's open to anyone to answer. So chime in. So our first question is from Venus Cobb. And the question is, what innovative, equitable strategies will be or are implemented to reach high poverty communities where access to education, training opportunities, and employment resources are limited? Who wants to take the first response to that? Lori, I'm always going to call on you. That's How about fun. you go? Uh, we're already doing so much. Our locations are nothing but the hardest to serve communities. Um, online learning is difficult because of access, yet it is the only method that is going to break through. So we need a little more investment perhaps in uh, providing enough access at home for families who really need. A long time ago, we were able to do that. We don't have a lot of money that allows for that now. Um, but uh, I think it's coming along due to the education issues. We've got to have public ed has got to be connected to the community, to the home. Um, the other issues for us would be the adult ed. Uh, it's very hard to pull people into a credential without that adult education initial credential. And so we've been exploring how else to do that. Um, we are involved with Jobs for the Future. We are looking at a couple of things. There'll be an announcement, but uh, <laughs> there's uh, another X Prize, and we are one of three or four involved with a JFF. And it will be about finding a better way to serve people and upskill people, bring people into the market at a livable wage, and that is the key here. 
Wonderful. So a question I, I'm going to direct it to Winji because it's asking as companies, how can we create a better coalition of companies, schools, accelerators doing training to get them connected with employers to help satisfy command? So from the business side, how can we really come together to build these coalitions and lead it in our community? Yeah, I think Lori hit the nail on the head earlier. You know, in one of our earlier Dallas Thrives kind of conversations, we talked about the need to connect the data. So saying this is going to be what our need is five years, 10 years down the line, and then being able to serve that data up to our educators um, to say, this is what we're going to need. How do we then partner with you? Not just to say, hey, you go train them so that we have them five years later, right? How do we do it together um, so that it's a joint, we're jointly walking this journey with the students all the way through um, and having that data transparency to say, okay, well, we've got this many people identified for these types of roles and we've got, you know, 50% of them filled. All right, we need to go find 50% more. Um, or, hey, we're doing really well because we filled the entire nursing pipeline, pipeline. I think that's a pipe dream, but, you know, we're there. And so how do we get there? And, and really having those conversations um, much more intentionally um, because I know in meeting some of the educators as I have in these conversations, you know, they're open and excited and thirsty for that information. Um, and it's up to us to, to serve it to them and partner with them um, for, for everybody involved. Wonderful. So I'm going to ask one last question. And I think this may be more directed to Ben and Dr. Weaver. So someone asked, uh, we are missing a large pool of potential workforce with our high school graduates. Uh, that only about 29% earn a post-secondary credential today. So how can we better address getting those students into post-secondary uh, education and workforce that will then lead to filling workforce gaps and needs? Dr. That's Weaver. Hard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard question um, because getting kids post-secondary ready uh, starts, you know, uh, when they're born. Uh, and so we know that some kids are much more ready because of just the environment and the, uh, the uh, you know, what they're afforded. Uh, there's no fault of their own. There's no benefit of their own. It's just, you know, that is, it is what it is. And there are some students that just start 15 paces behind the start line. Uh, and so I think we have to be thoughtful about how we are intentionally trying to uh, level the playing field, you know, close some of those equity gaps uh, and ensure that um, students are prepared once they enter into uh, uh, the K-12 system. And then once they get in the K-12 system, that we're thinking about all of their needs, not just some of their needs, because some of their needs won't fix the larger problem. We won't have kids post-secondary ready. We won't have black and brown kids post-secondary ready if they're not reading one grade level by third grade. And so way more resources need uh, to be um, allocated um, for the, you know, the, the early childhood parts. But then beyond that, we also got to think about what are all the skills and learnings kids need to have, know, understand, be able to do, be successful in so they can, um, you know, uh, exist in this world, this very different world that we're all living in. Um, that, that takes intentionality. And then ensuring that kids have access and are successful in the most rigorous courses that are available. You know, I think we can, uh, I think time is, is it's high time to uh, eliminate the, the different courses for different kids thing. Um, because that just um, perpetuates the inequities. And so whatever the highest level of rigor, uh, every kid should have should be in that class. And then the additional supports, whether that's personalization, direct teacher support, et cetera, tutors, whatever, those things need to be um, surrounding uh, those students to help make sure that they're getting what they need. Um, but there, there are some very basic items that should be in place in every school district. Uh, we're certainly working on them here in DeSoto ISD. Wonderful, thank you so much. Then really quickly, any thoughts from the community college side? Yeah, I just, I, I agree. And I think it, it, you know, part of that equitable, equitable approach is not assuming that, you know, that everybody starts at the same place. I think for a long time, we were operating under the assumption that like, okay, we're establishing this great offering, come and get it, right? Rather than reaching out into other uh, organizations with, you know, with partners. And I think what's exciting about the work that's already taken place with Thrives is you're really beginning to see those lines blur and how can Dallas College be more involved and, and be more of a support to uh, DISD and other districts, you know, to help make that transition for the student very seamless and understand, you know, how we can support what they're doing 
and how you know they can support what we're doing in you know the, in the higher education space. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. I wish we had all day to talk about this because it's just an incredible and timely conversation. We appreciate you being here today. We appreciate everything you're doing for our community. Please know it does not go unnoticed. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Beth Garvey, President and CEO of BGSF for a few closing remarks. Thank you, Chairman Daniel, Lori LeRae, Ben McGill, Wenji Tang Mayo, and Dr. Andre Weaver. What a great session. So workforce development is an issue that we continue to have be front of mind as, a start, as we start, as our state starts its economic recovery. With the creation of Dallas Thrives and leadership like we've seen today, Dallas is poised to be a national best practice in lifting up our community into and beyond a living wage. So a little bit about BGSF. So we are the 70th largest workforce solutions company in the US. And it has been my life work to get people back to work. Um, we have operated in three different segments. We have a light industrial um, segment working in logistics and warehousing. We have a real estate segment that works in maintenance, provides a support to um, multifamily and commercial buildings in maintenance and leasing. And then we have our professional division that is high-end IT and finance and accounting. And this topic to me is such a big topic because I, we have the ability to be able to see the disparity between all ranks. We have the lower level warehouse people, we have our higher level um, IT folks, but everywhere in between, we need to have education be part of how, this move, how we move through and improve the communities that we're in. One of the phrases, it's my favorite phrase, is everything starts with a job. And I truly believe that everything starts with a job. It's the dignity of having a job, being able to make a living wage, to be able to continue to, to improve yourself as you get a better, a better education to move up the ranks at the current job you have. It allows you to feed your children, to send them to school, to buy a house, to buy a car. But more importantly, once you get all that done, it allows you to be a very instrumental part of a community. And and I feel like our job as business leaders is to really focus on that. It is not just a transactional business for us. It is what can we do to help make companies and the people that we serve with our talent pool, how do we help elevate them so they can be active and powerful members of communities. And so for that, I'm proud of my life work and all the people of BGSF who make that happen every day. So. Lastly, we invite you to continue the conversation on workforce needs as at the upcoming DRC Workforce Recovery Roundtables event series presented by Texas Mutual, focused on hearing how COVID-19 has impacted your workforce and how the DRC can support workforce recovery. Visit dallaschamber.org forward slash events to learn more and register to attend the events next week. Thank you again for joining us. It's been a powerful uh, few hours and um, I hope you guys have an amazing week and we're now adjourned.